My name is Arnie, old computer guy, and I've spent the last 25 years or so in the computer repair and training business. In addition to working on computers, phones, and networks, I teach certifications to computer students at my store and school in East Hampton, Connecticut in the U.S. My place is called On Track Computers, and I welcome to have you come and visit us at our webpage, OnTrackComputer.com, or if you're in East Hampton, Connecticut, which is probably <laughs> unlikely, uh, feel free to stop in or say hello. Today I'm going to do a short training on introduction to telephones, basic telephone systems. Why? Because I find that a lot of people who are pretty computer street smart, people who know their way around Windows and wiring and Wi-Fi and networks, don't know jack about telephones, which have been around for a hundred years. They may talk good talk about new stuff with fellow geeks and nerds, but when they open their mouths about telephone equipment, the things that spill out are just plain embarrassing. You see, every industry has its slang and jargon and basic equipment names and ideas, and one sure way to look like you just fell off the stupid bus is to not use the proper words, or even worse, to twist the meaning of the words to fellow professionals. You might look and act like you have it all together with your dress and the car you drive, but it doesn't bode well when you utter unintelligent words that give you away as a newbie. So today, I'll help you to correct your problem, to learn the basics of how telephones and such work, and I'll give you a starting vocabulary that will put you in the game. Think of this as finishing school 101 for basic telephone. Today we'll cover some concepts for home and small business telephones like DMARC, CO, Tip and Ring, 66 Block, RJ11, PSTN, POTS, PBX, hunting and trunks and jacks and stations and ports and extensions and subscribers and the difference between analog and digital. If you don't know any of those words or you're unsure of some of those definitions, this is the place for you. And by the end of this short class, um, you'll be a, a, a ringer for, with all those and you'll have all that information. What we won't be covering here is VOIP, VOIP, which is really not telephone. Although it does things that mimic and mirror what telephones do, it's really sound traffic being carried over data lines digitally. And although that idea of sending voices over wires might seem like what telephones do, it's an entirely different technology. So VoIP, V-O-I-P, uh, Voice Over Internet Protocol, is going to be another day, another class. Computers and telephones are merging, and you need to know the basics. This merging process is known as convergence, where a business might have a computer, internet network, a, a VoIP network, a security or surveillance network, and these different projects, these different aspects of the business begin to interface and maybe share resources. Um, that's known as convergence, and again, that's not the subject of today's training. We're just going to learn about the basics of telephones, plain old telephones. So that's a good starting point. These plain old telephones that were commonplace even in your great-grandparents' homes, even 100 years ago, are not very complicated by today's standards. That's the good news. They really couldn't be complicated because they were invented in the days before computers or even before transistors and even before vacuum tubes. They are just a step above the dot and dash world of telegraph, where words and letters were broken down into a Morse code of different beeps long beeps and short beeps, dots and dashes. Telephones go one step beyond this, though, in one important way. They carry our human voice instead of just a series of tones. Same two wires, but the ability to hear a voice instead of a tone made all the difference in the world. It brought people together from around the globe to exchange news and ideas at the speed of light and to keep people in touch by the sound, many times a comforting sound, of the human voice. While telephones aren't very complicated, they do have some unusual characteristics about them, and they certainly have a language and culture about them. So let's take a few minutes to get up to speed with these plain old telephone systems. Here we go. Actually, one name for the telephone network, the kind of internet, if you will, of telephones, is lovingly called POTS, P-O-T-S, which stands for plain old telephone network, plain old telephone system, sorry. The more formal and accurate name for it is the PSTN, the Public Switching Telephone Network. So POTS is the same as PSTN. POTS is just the kind of slang term that we use. Just like we have a name for the digital network that we use for our computers called the Internet, the web of wires that's woven across the globe that handles basic telephone calls is called the PSTN. And just like 
we have protocols on the internet, the PSTN has rules of how the calls are connected, what a telephone number format should be, and standards for things like ringing and busy signals. These rules in the U.S. and in North America are defined by a set of standards, which is known as the North American Numbering Plan, or NANP, the North American Numbering Plan. And this details that a telephone number begins with a country code, it has a three-digit area code, it has a three-digit exchange after that, and it has a four-digit subscriber number. And using this information, the call can travel from general area to general area, and then to a specific exchange building, and finally to an individual telephone. You can think of this as being similar to the way that post offices that have zip codes and street addresses work. A letter goes from your home, which is a specific place, and it's consolidated at your local post office. And then using the first two numbers in the dip zip code, it goes to a regional distribution center and then to another regional center near the recipient of the letter. From there it goes to their local post office using the last three letters of the zip code and finally it gets delivered by a carrier to the individual street address. Telephone calls similarly get collected at the local central office, get switched out to the correct area, get routed to the receiver's central office, and then to their individual telephones. And this is done, the same process as zip codes that I just described, by peeling off layers or elements of the telephone number from the general to the more specific. So here's a few concepts. Each telephone line is comprised of two wires. As you know, electrically, this can make a complete circuit, which is what we're after. If you've ever stood up to a microphone, maybe to sing some karaoke late at night, I don't want to know that story, you know that the sound of your voice is carried through the mic wires into an amplifier that projects your voice to others. We can think of the telephone as being kind of a, a two-way PA system with both a microphone and speaker, which is in your telephone set, on each end. Although it happens over a great distance and it's not greatly amplified like the PA system at the bar or club, it's amplified just enough to hear when held up to your ear. A key point here and this is important, is that the original voice signal is carried directly from the speaker to the listener. It's an important point. Each phone line has a unique phone number, and it goes from your home or business directly to a local building that acts as a switching station. So this building is known as the CO, or central office. Whatever the route from your home or office, underground or utility poles, your pair of wires makes its way all the way directly to the CO. Since there are no interruptions and the connection is direct, this is known in the trade as a home run, just like in baseball, but nothing to do with baseball. That just means, a home run means, that it's a direct connection. So you have a home run from your office or business to the CO, the central office. In the old days, there were actually people, operators, who used jacks, which looks similar to a guitar plug, to connect your call within the correct with the correct region that it was going to. There was a plug for every phone number in town and there was a connection jack to various areas around the country that you might want to call. Since the plugs were connected, the pair of wires from your telephone was connected to the destination. And since they had two contacts on them in this guitar plug-like thing, these two wires were called tip and ring. Again, two more definitions. The tip was the end of the plug and the ring was the outside jacket of the plug. And these words are still used today to indicate the two wires in a pair that carry your calls. If you think about it, many things about us in life are divided up into property boundaries. We have a private property, we have public property. And in each case, someone has responsibility or has to take responsibility for what happens in that particular area. It turns out that the telephone providers who own and manage the wires and COs take responsibility for the integrity and operation of their equipment and wires. But they are not interested in taking responsibility for what is outside their control, for what might go on inside your home or office. So we have this handoff point where the responsibility of the provider, called the telco or telephone company, ends. And that is a point of demarcation, if you will. It's a line in the sand. Um, where they split off what the telephone company or telco is responsible for and what you inside your building are responsible for. And it's called the DMARC, D-E-M-A-R-C, the DMARC. It's usually a box on the outside or near the entrance of service on the building, and the telco people get their wires to this point. That's their responsibility, and the rest is up to you. 
Anything inside of the DMARC is our problem. Anything beyond the DMARC on the way to the CO is the telephone company or provider's responsibility. There's a common device that's used when there's multiple lines coming in from the DMARC and or multiple lines in your building going to different phone jacks around your building, and it's called a 66 block. It's a junction point. It has 25 line connectors on each side, and it has a series of pins that can hold wires. Often the incoming telephone lines with the ones that carry phone numbers are punched into the left side of the block, and again, they're in pairs. And in a different area of the block, the pair of the wires from each phone jack in the building can also be punched in. So this provides a convenient and standardized central place, usually located in a phone closet or a basement, that lines can be interconnected or tapped into for telephone equipment or wiring. There's a spring-loaded tool known as a 66 punch tool that perfectly pushes a single wire into each of the 66 block connectors, making a solid electrical connection. In a residence, these pairs of wires um, sometimes don't use a 66 block, and they just come in a bundle of four wires. So when you get one of these four wire bundles, uh, they're typically four different colors. Red and green, which would be used for the main line or one line, and then yellow and black, which are used for the second line. So this whole cable with four wires or two pair of wires can be used for two lines. The standard clear plastic connectors that we're all familiar with where we plug something into a phone jack is called an RJ11 connector. So you can have an RJ11 plug at the end of your phone and an RJ11 jack in the wall that it plugs into. It's able to hold six wires and can have six connections, but generally only four are used. If we were to look at those six wires in the RJ11 connector um, and we numbered the pins from one to six, the center two, which would be pins three and four, are always connected to the main line with the red and green pair, if that's the color wires we're using. So the center two pins, pins three and four, are connected with the color-coded wires, red and green, for our main line. If we're going to be using a second line, we use the two pins just outside of those. So that would be pins two and five, and those are connected with the yellow and black wire uh, that might come in our um, four-wire um, telephone cable. In commercial buildings, there often are tons of phone lines coming in, so using a four-wire cable just isn't practical. Uh, so there's tons of wires coming in from the CO, and they use a larger cable, usually with 25 pair of wires in it, capable of carrying 25 lines. Each pair has a solid color wire twisted around a wire that is striped with a solid color. By agreement, the striped wire goes first on top of the 66 block, and the solid one right below it, so every two wires makes a pair or a phone line. Um, each pair is one phone line, and it's again a solid and a striped um, colored wire. Since these 25 pair cables are common, as well as the 66 block that we use for connection, sometimes you'll actually see a pre-wired 66 block that connects all of the wires to an oval metal connector known as an amphenol connector. It's A-M-P-H-E-N-O-L. An amphenol uh, connector uh, allows a quick connection of all 25 lines and extensions to a business phone system with just one connection. And Amphenol, Amphenol refers to the name of the company that makes the connector. It's not a, a description of, of anything else. It's just a, um, a business name. So if you're still with me, probably a good time for a review. Um, the telephone network is called the PSTN or POTS public switched telephone network or plain old telephone system. The telco or provider company manages the switching and calls on the PSTN, and the local office near your home or business is called the central office or CO. The wiring from the CO to your home or business ends at a specific place, a junction box, which is called the DMARC. And past the DMARC, the building wiring is our responsibility. The phone line comes in on two wires, and from the past, these are known as tip and ring, based on the plugs that they used to use. From the DMARC, these are either connected directly uh, to a two-pair wire of red, green, and yellow, black that travels through our house to various phones. Or at a business, the lines from the DMARC are commonly brought to a wiring junction called the 66 block, which contains 25 pairs of wires. From here, connections can be made to the incoming phone lines, 
and also to the phone jacks throughout the building that our phones might be plugged into. Wires are spliced onto the 66 block using a tool called a punch tool and sometimes an amphenol connector is pre-wired to the 66 block to make these connections faster. The common phone connector is called an RJ11 plug. It contains six pins and the center two which would use red or green wires typically carry the primary phone line signal. If we have a second phone that's being carried down that cable the next two pins out, pins two and five, would use the yellow and black wire and they would carry the second line signal if there is one. So congratulations. See, in just a few minutes you became much smarter. We've barely met. I already like you. Good work. If you're locked on to this information, we'll go on. Otherwise, this might be a good time to stop and maybe replay the video to this point and review this information so that it sinks in and you can kind of lock onto it. From here, let's talk about business phones. The idea of a single phone line or two lines in a home or home business, which sometimes is called SOHO, S-O-H-O, or small office, home office, is pretty straightforward. With one person running the business and maybe a second line for fax, two lines will do just fine. But let's take the example of a business with 20 employees. We've become used to business phone features like putting people on hold, having an intercom between phones, maybe paging, doing conference calling, and giving one telephone set the ability to answer multiple lines. Clearly, if we had 20 people and each had a simple phone and their own individual phone number, this would not be possible, and it would be pretty clumsy. It also would be very expensive. In reality, 20 people aren't always on the phone, unless your business is in some kind of call center where the work that you do is exclusively on the phone. 20 people in reality could probably share five phone lines to handle calls coming in and their calls going out. To do this, though, we need some kind of internal phone clearinghouse or switching system or server that can manage the telephone traffic. This device exists and it's called a PBX. A PBX manages and routes all the calls in an organization. It's typically a, a box on the wall. In the old days it was a, a whole basement uh, full of racks and boxes. Today uh, it's probably the size of a laptop computer or so mounted on the wall. But the PBX routes all the calls in an organization. Although phones really, as we've discovered, are not complicated, it's two wires and can't do too much with it, the PBX um, also is not terrifically complicated. It can only do maybe a dozen different types of activities. But the combination of the variety of lines that we have, of incoming lines, and these dozen different activities that can be grouped together can make uh, some pretty complex scenarios and rules possible on a PBX. So let's take a look at some of the common features of a PBX and some of the terms that you might want to learn to talk good phone speak. Remember, the PBX handles the rules for all the phone traffic inside the building. That's kind of a definition of what a PBX is. Physically, a PBX is connected to outside phone lines coming into it. These are affectionately called trunk lines. So trunk lines are all the incoming numbers from the DMARC and onto the CO. From there that you've purchased from the telephone company or telco. The rules and behavior of these trunk lines before they get to your business is actually the responsibility of the telco, so they'll need to be set with the provider. An example of such a feature is whether a line is good for only local calling or if it has unlimited long distance on it. Another common feature is what we call having a main number roll over to a second line if, it's, if the primary line is busy. Now, a sure way to get laughed out of the party when talking with phone people is to talk about a line rolling over, which sounds like a circus act with wild animals or something like that. Um, the insider correct word for rolling over is hunting, so that's a new term we want to learn. Here's an example. When we order five lines, we may designate the primary line as the one that will appear in all of our correspondence and advertising, in directory listings, in our business card, on our web page. And the other four numbers are there, but they're never published. They're there for our own use to dial out on and to catch the overflow of incoming calls if the primary number is busy. So we can call the telco provider, the company that we do business with, maybe AT&T or Sprint or Verizon or Bell Atlantic, and we'll tell them which one is the primary line. And then we set up what's called hunting, 
or what is called a hunt group on a, in a specific order for the remaining lines. An example for my business, my main number is 860-267-6962. And I've designated this as my primary number. It's the one that's listed everywhere. But the other five lines that I've purchased will be used as a hunt group should someone call and the first line is busy. Anyone calling in, if that first line is busy, will just hear a normal ring on the main number. They won't know that anything's different. But internally, we'll see that call come in on line two or line three. The important point to remember is that this is called hunting or setting up a hunt group and that it's set up outside of our business by the CO. Calls originating inside our business though and the rules for these calls are determined by programming the PBX. Call routing of incoming calls once they arrive over the trunk lines are also determined by our PBX. We can identify the incoming trunk lines for example into groups may be dependent on whether they have long distance service associated with them. When we divide trunk lines into groups, they are called, ready, trunk groups. Now that's probably the first thing today that makes sense to you. So trunk group is just grouping the trunk lines or the incoming lines uh, into our business. Depending on how many lines are ringing, we could send the incoming calls to different departments. Sometimes we can send an incoming call to ring on more than one phone at a time to a group of different telephones around our office. And this is called a call group. So a call group is when we set up groups of our telephones, maybe at different desks around the office. Uh, trunk group is when we group the incoming lines coming in from the telephone company. On a PBX, we can also set up rules for which lines our employees can call out on how many rings until they're forwarded to a specific place, etc. And there's even a service called outcalling where an incoming call to our business could be rerouted to a particular cell phone or alternate phone number. Now, that sounds like a, a breeze because you could conduct business and stay home or just pick up the calls on your cell phone. But this can be a hazardous behavior if you're a business owner. Can you see why? I'll give you a minute to think about the danger of routing an incoming call back out through the PBX. The problem lies in the number of lines used. That one call is using one line coming in, but it requires a second line to dial back out, using a total of two lines for one call. If we only have five lines total for 20 people, and one call uses up two of them, I think that you can see the potential problem. Employees love the idea of having their office calls follow them around and get routed out of the office, but employers need to be cautious of using up all of their phone resources. Businesses use a PBX to run their organization with the minimum number of trunk lines. Outcalling defeats this. Anyway, PBX do the phone routing within your building and for your business. Here's a few words that you should know. You and I commonly look around an office and we see telephone units plugged into wall jacks, maybe sitting on people's desks. As we discussed, these all feed back to the PBX. Each of these hardwired connections to the PBX is called a station, though, and not a telephone. A station is a little bit more general term that means a hardwired connection to the PBX. If you have an intercom system in your stock room, maybe a speaker on the wall, that connection also is a station but it's obviously not a telephone. There also could be a, a entry box at perhaps a security door um, that's an additional station on the phone and that someone can press a button that would ring someone's phone uh, maybe to let them into a locked door. Again, this is a station but not a telephone. So we want to make a distinction um, between the terminology of a telephone, which is a physical device, and a station, which is a hardwired connection to the PBX. You know that sometimes when you get someone's business card, it has an extension on it. Well, the PBX also works with extensions, which are numbers that can be associated with stations. Extensions, like stations, are more logical devices than physical. It's sort of like on your Windows computer, if you go to my computer, um, your physical hard drive can be divided into sections or partitions. So you could have two sections, let's say, on one single hard drive. And each of these get a logical identifier, like drive C or drive D. There's only one physical drive, 
but there's two logical drive letters that the computer sees as two different things. Extensions are kind of like this. They're logical descriptors that the PBX uses that can be assigned to physical devices or not. Someone could dial a particular extension and they could get rooted to a particular phone. But they could dial an extension and just get sent right over to voicemail and never have it ring at a physical station. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But for now, looking at PBXs, here's some things to remember. A PBX handles the internal call rules of the business. The telco or provider manages the outside rules of the incoming phone lines, such as long distance services and hunt groups. The physical lines that come from the PBX to various points of the business uh, in the building are called stations. Many of these are telephones, but they can also be things like paging, speakers, and intercoms. The PBX internally works with logical extensions, which are then assigned or mapped to various stations or to voicemail features. Got it? Great. Just a few more points and we'll be done. You'll be an expert or an expert in the basics anyway. In the past, the PBX was invented first, that switching device uh, that took care of uh, routing calls uh, inside a business. But then a wonderful invention came. There was an add-on to the original PBX, and that was the idea of an internal voicemail system. It digitally stored recordings of messages, so it could do one of two things. It could record a message that perhaps someone left, and it could play back messages. So the PBX, which routes calls around your office, and the voicemail system actually are separate. And although today these two technologies might come in the same box, um, the distinction of the two being separate has continued on in the telephone business. So the PBX, which um, does the, the routing of calls around, and the voicemail system, which handles recording and playing, are two separate things. Um, on the PBX, we remember that extensions, which are those logical numbers, could be routed not only to stations, to a physical telephone to ring, but now they could be routed to a voicemail box where someone could leave a message. When we speak of voicemail, um, these voicemail sections or boxes, um, the incoming voicemail boxes have a special name. They're not called voicemail boxes. They are called subscribers. A typical modern system would include just one physical box that contains, as I said, both a PBX and voicemail system, but by long-standing tradition, they're treated separately even though they might come in the same box. So remember, PBXs have physical stations, and then they have logical extensions or st extension numbers that can be routed to different stations or to voicemail. And voicemail, which is a separate unit, has subscribers stations, extensions, and subscribers. So some of the complexity of understanding and programming these devices stems from this separation of the PBX from the voicemail system. I know you've been caught in that annoying rabbit hole of a recorded message played when you dial a business. You hope for a human when you make the call, but instead you get a message of choices. Press one for sales, two for accounting, three for purchasing. This type of message is known as an auto attendant auto-attendant for obvious reasons. It saves having to hire a live human being to answer the phones. And it helps the PBX to route the calls to the appropriate extensions and stations. Now here's where things get a bit more complex, but since you understand this, it's really not complicated for you. You just need to remember two easy things. Here's thing number one. A PBX routes calls. And number two, a voicemail system plays and records messages. Got it? Easy peasy, easy stuff. So let's have a look at that annoying auto attendant message that plays when you call a business. The PBX sees the call coming in and it routes it to an extension over on the voicemail side that plays the message. For sales, press one. For service, press two. If you know your party's extension, dial it at any time. Ba 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 ba. The message comes from the voicemail system. Now the choice that you make, the number that you punch in, one or two or someone's extension or zero to speak with a human, is heard by the PBX, which then makes a routing decision based on how it was programmed. Here's another example. When someone calls and they get flipped over to the voicemail system, auto attendant, 
perhaps they dial someone's extension, say 121 for patty and sales. The PBX then sees the extension 121 ext extension and it examines its rules for that extension. They might be to ring Patty's phone at station 21 for four rings or so. And rule two is if it's not picked up, then to flip the call over to her voicemail box. So you can see how the PBX can have rules. One more quick idea. Since the PBX and voicemail are separate, even though they're in the same box on the wall, there needs to be a connection between these two separate functions, between the PBX and between voicemail. And this is sometimes how people can get tricked uh, into paying a lot of extra money when they're purchasing their PBXs. These lines, if you will, between the PBX into the voicemail are called ports, new word. Many voicemail units come with a limited number of ports. That's kind of the gotcha. So since every call coming in is probably being routed to the auto attendant in the voicemail unit, it will use a port. And you have to have enough ports so that all the traffic that you expect that can flow through the PBX into voicemail has a port. Once you've reached the limit of the number of ports that you purchased or licensed from the manufacturer, your calls will freeze up in the PBX in a kind of limbo, or they might just get dropped. So planning becomes so important with these situations. You need to think through the number of trunk lines that you'll need, stations, extensions, subscribers, and ports. That's it. We're almost done. I'm proud of you. We've covered a lot and picked up some important new vocabulary. Two more thoughts that I think maybe will be helpful. Regular phone lines, like in your home, are analog. They rely on voltage. It's kind of that microphone amplifier idea. They actually connect the telephone that you speak into to the receiving telephone, which is possibly across the world. In businesses, the PBX manufacturer has decided to use those familiar telephone jacks from stations in the office back to the PBX. Those are called RJ11s, you remember. But early on, they found that they could use these wires, same wires, to send digital messages. These are now computer messages, if you will, back to the PBX, and not use them for analog sound signals. Digital messages convert everything into electronic numbers, ones and zeros, and they send information, not sound. The important point here is that uh, those regular looking phone jacks around an office are not usually standard phone jacks like in your house. They're meant for digital telephone sets that can do amazing and wonderful things as they communicate with the PBX, but they will not work with a standard analog phone. It's just speaking a different language. Sometimes a PBX will only work with a specific brand of digital phone, so it's quite specific what you need to plug in to those station jacks. The important point is that the basic analog phones that you might have at home, or phone devices like faxes or modems, will only work when connected to a standard analog phone jack and will not work when connected to a digital station. The plugs look alike, and your plug will fit into the jack, but everything else won't work. So here's what I promised you. Way in the beginning, we talked about some basic words that we've learned about. And those words were DMARC, CO, Tip and Ring, 66 Block, RJ11, PSTN, POTS, and PBX, Hunting, and Trunks, and Jacks, and Stations, and Ports, and Extensions, and Subscribers, and Analog and Digital. I just gave you that list, and hopefully, although you may have a moment uh, that it'll take you to recall these, hopefully you now have an understanding of what all of those terms are, which will really give you a good foundational understanding of how basic telephones work. I'd like to congratulate you. Good work. We made it through this far. Again, I'm Arnie, the old computer guy at arnieoldcomputerguy.com, and I hope that I've raised up your vocabulary of basic telephone systems. I'd invite you to take a moment and leave me a comment, what I did well, maybe what I could improve on, and other training classes that you'd like to see. Subscribe now to my channel here on YouTube, and you can be in touch with new video classes that uh, I'll be doing very shortly in the future. It's been so nice spending time with you. Have a great day.